Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum and I'm here today at the James Julia Auction House taking a look at some of the guns that they're going to be selling in their upcoming Fall of 2017 Firearms Auction. Specifically today we're looking at a bunch of Sturmgewehrs. They have a, a nice selection here in this upcoming auction and I thought this would give us a really good chance to talk about the evolution of this design because there are actually four different designations plus the MKBs. There's the MP43-1, there's the MP43, there's the MP44, there's the STG44, and well, what's the difference? What are all of these different things? So today we're going to actually address that, uh, as well as how these guns actually were adopted into service with the German military. Now, the beginning of this story is the MKB42. I have a separate video on one of those, which you should go check out if you haven't seen it yet. Basically, that set the stage. That, that was the initial major development for what is what became known as the assault rifle. The idea of a selective fire intermediate cartridge uh, infantry shoulder rifle. It was intended to be able to deliver a high volume of full auto fire at very close range, like a submachine gun, while also being able to deliver accurate, precise fire out to about 400 meters, like a rifle. This was developed by the Germans basically out of a sense of desperation in the, the failing campaign against Russia uh, in the East, and they were hugely outnumbered, and they really just needed some way to increase the firepower of the infantry unit, and this was the way to do it. So, uh, the first major adaptation that happened was to change the MKB-42 from an open bolt gun into a closed bolt gun. That closed bolt operation was really necessary to get the accurate precision fire that was half of the purpose of these rifles. And uh, yeah, it was really kind of a no-brainer of a, a change to make. And the first closed bolt version was the MP43-1. Now, with this rifle, they were still using a number of, well, a couple of components off the MKB-42, primarily barrels, uh, and along with the barrels, the, the muzzle nuts, and the front sight blocks, and the stuff that clamps onto the barrel there. And that turned out to be a bit of an issue because the MKB-42 barrel is a little bit larger in diameter than the Car-98 barrel, uh, Car-98K barrel, which meant that muzzle accessories for the K-98K wouldn't fit onto this. Things like uh, blank firing adapters, although you don't need a blank firing adapter for a K-98K, I suppose. Uh, grenade launchers were a big one. There were plans to make a suppressor for these rifles. Um, and they wanted, they decided that they wanted to make the, the MP series interchangeable with the K98K. So the MP43-1 began using MKB42 barrels and slowly, was, it was basically a transitional model that slowly moved over to new stepped barrels, uh, what would eventually become the MP43. And really the only mechanical change there was reducing the diameter of the end of the barrel. This sounds like a very obvious quick and easy change to make, but at the same time, they were also desperately trying to make as many of the guns as possible and shutting down the tooling to change things like lathe settings and change the dimensions of the casting for the front sight block to fit a smaller diameter barrel. They, they didn't want to shut down production uh, you know, and have no guns coming out for a period in order to make that change. So instead, what they did was kind of run two lines simultaneously and they phased out one and phased in the other. So. Uh, MKB-42 production and MP-43-1 production actually overlapped for a couple of months. Uh, the MP-43 went into production in July of 43. Uh, the MKB-42 production ended in September of 43. Now, through this whole period, Hitler was actually pretty adamantly opposed to the adoption of these rifles. He was really focused on long-range firepower and telescopic sights, and what, what he was really pushing was basically the Gewehr 43, a self-loading 8mm Mauser full-power cartridge, the idea that he could give every soldier a semi-automatic sniper rifle, which, by the way, is not that different than what the Russians were trying to do in 1939-1940 with the SVT-40. And without the sniper rifle part, it's exactly what the Americans did with the M1 Garand. However, a number of the people in uh, German Army Command had experience fighting in the Russian front by 1943, and they understood the absolute necessity if Germany was going to win in its outnumbered and undersupplied state there, the absolute necessity of having 
basically an assault rifle, um, something where the full auto firepower was actually controllable by using a reduced length cartridge like the 8x33 millimeter cartridge that these rifles used. So despite Hitler, like on three separate occasions, uh, ordering that these rifles not be developed, not be used, not be issued, uh, despite that, Army Command continued to pursue their development and use. And they did it through some kind of sneaky tricks and subterfuge and sometimes just flat out ignoring orders. And in the end, it was a good thing for them that they did. Uh, but we do have to, we'll, we'll see some elements as we go through this history of things they had to do to kind of skirt Hitler's orders on this subject. So the first big hurdle for the new Sturmgewehr was a serious large-scale combat trial. And this was done in October and November of 1943. And interestingly, the, the big hurdle for it was not actually the guns, it was actually the ammunition. Uh, German production of 8mm Kurtz ammunition was really slow to, to pick up. Um, obviously, at this point, Germany's having production and material supply issues with pretty much everything. But uh, if you think about it, you know, you don't think, well, how much ammunition do you really need? It's not that big a deal, is it? Well, they estimated that every rifle in frontline service needed a thousand rounds a month uh, as a basic firing load. That's what you would expect guys to be shooting. And when you start to multiply that out by thousands of guns, that quickly becomes a lot of ammunition. And it was this ammunition supply that dictated how many guns could actually be put in this late 1943 combat trial. The answer was 6,800. So they were able to supply ammunition for 6,800 MP43s in combat trials on the Eastern Front in October and November of 43. They got an update uh, at the end of the first month and then there was supposed to be a full major report submitted by every unit at the end of the second month. Well, by the end of the first month, things were obviously going so well with the guns that they went ahead with further development and adoption and production without even bothering to wait for the end of the combat trial. Uh, times were very tough for the German army on the Eastern Front, and they needed every advantage they could get, and this was going to be a substantial advantage for the infantrymen. One of the first ways that uh, the army was able to get around Hitler's decrees on prohibiting the, the MP44 uh, was in October of 1943, they were able to get him to agree to formally replace the MP40 with the MP43. Now, Hitler was commander-in-chief of the German military, but he was really much more interested in strategic and operational level elements more than, you know, the tactical level of how many grenades are the guys carrying and what rifle does everyone have and what's the squad organization. And so, at a brief glance, the idea that, hey, we have this cool new 1943 pattern machine pistol and we want to replace the old machine pistol with it and this new one's great. Here, just sign here and they were able to get that passed. Uh, probably had actually some support from Heinrich Himmler on that one. Uh, Himmler was in charge of the Waffen SS and there was probably, there were probably a bunch of Waffen SS guys who were really trying to get their hands on these guns as well. By November of 43, things were going so well with this combat trial that before the formal reports were even in, the army had made the decision that it wanted to replace a uh, hundred divisions infantry rifles with MP44s. Now that obviously was a ludicrously optimistic plan that would never actually come to fruition, but that is how desperate the combat was at that point in Russia and how effective the rifle was actually doing. Now the first of our major name changes comes, we don't have the actual document, but it's somewhere between December of 43 and January of 44. And that is when the MP43-1 becomes this, just the standard MP43. At that point, it has the stepped barrel, it has the threaded muzzle, same dimensions, interchangeable with Car 98K accessories. And that's basically the pattern of rifle that would, uh, that, that was the definitive pattern of the rifle for the rest of the war. By February of 1944, just to put things in perspective, the German army on the Eastern Front had about 9,300 of these MP43 rifles, or of, of all the previous types. MKBs were still around, uh, MP43-1s, and then they're starting to get MP43s. But they only had like 9,300 of them at the beginning of 1944. So the idea, it's important to keep in perspective just how many of these guns were actually around at any given time, because they never came anywhere close to replacing all of the German rifles. Now we get to the easy part, because the next question is, well, what's the change from the MP43 to the MP44 and from the MP44 to the STG44? And the answer is literally nothing except the name. 
So in April of 1944, uh, the name was formally changed from MP43 to MP44, and this was basically just, I think someone got bored in the bureaucracy. This was the exact same time that they changed the Gewehr 43 to be the Carabiner 43, G43 to K43. It was literally nothing but a bureaucratic name change. And then the same thing, based, well, kind of the same thing happened in October of 44. At that point, uh, Hitler had finally been fully convinced of the importance of using the, the STG-44, the MP-44, the MP-43, all the same gun. He'd finally been uh, convinced of the importance of having this as the standard rifle and the, the concept of the assault rifle. And so in October 44, he issued an order that they were now to be renamed Sturmgewehr 44 because machine pistol didn't properly reflect the actual role of the gun, which is was deliberate. It was the machine pistol designation that had allowed the army to basically develop this gun uh, under Hitler's nose without being uh, without it being recognized what the thing really was. Well, when he, when Hitler finally did recognize it, then the name's going to change and it's going to get a name that truly reflects what the gun is. It really is kind of surprising just how few changes that were made to the Sturmgewehr series of rifles over the course of the war. Uh, if you look at something like the Car 98K, there was really a lot more variation uh, from start to finish in that than you'll find in this. Now, that said, uh, there are a couple, there are two different areas that we're going to take a look at. One is uh, the change, the transitional changes in the MP43-1, and then there were also a number of late production changes for efficiency that were made, and we'll take a look at some of those as well. Now, here we have the 43-1, and this uses, this is using an MKB-42H barrel uh, and front assembly, and then this is an STG-44. Now, uh, ignore the fact that it doesn't have a front sight hood. It should have. It's just come off on this particular gun. What we can see for the details that changed here are the barrel diameter. You can see that the, the uh, MP44 barrel, or the STG44 barrel here, is stepped. The 43-1 barrel here is not. And then the visually identifiable change is this muzzle nut. So the 42, the MKB42 and then MP43-1 muzzle nut is longer and it has two sets of notches in it. The later standard Sturmgewehr muzzle nut is much shorter uh, and just has this little narrow cut in the center. There were a couple other associated changes. If you look at the profile of the front sight block, you can see that it's a little bit different on the two. Uh, that's really kind of incidental to the change in barrel diameter. Now what's really kind of ironic is they went to all this work to change from this to this and change the model designation and they spent several months adjusting tooling progressively to do it without losing production capacity. And in the end, they never ended up actually fielding a grenade launcher for the Sturmgewehr series. They had to do some experimentation with uh, gas nuts up here to come up with like a gas cutoff system so that you could launch grenades. That's always an issue with semi-automatic rifles. You don't want the, the extra uh, recoil impulse to throw the bolt carrier back with enough force that you might damage it. So you come up with some sort of gas cutoff. Well, by the time they got done with that and then coming up with uh, grenade uh, firing cartridges for the 8x33, they ultimately decided that, you know what, we still have a bunch of Mauser rifles in the field and those work just fine for grenades and we'll just keep using them. So this all ended up being for naught. Uh, even the other elements that they used this threaded muzzle for ended up not being adopted. The suppressors that were discussed and planned were never put into production. The blank firing adapters were never put into production. Uh, so they really could have just had a, a simple flat muzzle uh, from the very beginning. They did ultimately at the very end of the war have an, a few guns at the end that came out with a smooth muzzle and no muzzle nut. but. Uh, could, could have been done years earlier with literally no loss of capability. Just so you get a closer look at it here, this is the MP43-1. You can see that designation right up here in the side. And then we have, uh, as is standard on Sturmgewehrs, we have a serial number and a production date down here. So this is a 1943 production gun. Um, all of the, uh, the 43 ones were pretty much all 1943 production. There's that model designation up a little bit closer. There is one other feature you will sometimes see in these transitional 43 ones. 
This one is a late enough gun that it doesn't have it. And that is a pair of stamped rails in the rear sight block here that were meant to potentially fit a ZF-41 uh, one and a half power optical sight. That was something that was used on the MKB-42s and it was slowly transitioned out in the 43 ones. Uh, it turned out that this style of sight attachment up here for a scope was simply not stable and effective. They would later experiment with a ZF-4 mounted on the right side of the receiver of the MP-44, but those would prove to be ineffective as well. Now there are a number of other changes that we can look at, uh, changes that occurred at the basically at the end of production to simplify the guns. Um, we'll start with the most obvious one. This is this two-tone sort of finish. And the reason for this is that MP44 production involved a whole lot of subcontractors. There were a couple main assembly firms, uh, and then uh, some of the major companies only made parts. For example, this one has a receiver that was made by Mauser, but it was actually assembled and proofed and finished by Hanel. And then the small parts, little pieces like magazine buttons and sights, all these things were made by a ton of subcontracting small companies, and so conditions would vary. And in this case, what we have is a style of finish here. It's this smooth gray finish that existed only for a very short time. This was like January to March of 1945. Uh, after that, they would go to what we would think of as a parkerized finish, uh, basically a, a rough uh, gray phosphating. But for a short time, there was this smooth gray finish and then there was also the nice blue and there was a period of rifles where they ran out of blued receivers before they ran out of blued fire control uh, you know grip units and so they assembled guns that were a mix and match of different colors and kind of cool to see that it's an interesting historical uh, quirk one of the other more substantial changes made uh, was in March of 1944, a change to the buttstock style. If you look closely, you'll notice that this one is a bit taller than that one. What someone realized is that this, which is the buttstock profile from the MKB-42, uh, didn't fit in the vehicular clamps, the brackets for mounting Car 98K rifles. So they decided that if they just made a fairly small change, they made this about an inch uh, shorter, then these stocks would now fit in all of the existing vehicle brackets. And so they made the change, they decided it didn't make any difference for shootability, and it did give them this nice new ability uh, to continue using some existing equipment. If I overlay the stocks like that, you can really see that difference. Now we're gonna get down to some really pretty minor details, uh, things like where the guns had used wood grips uh, for the vast majority of production, by very late in the war, they started adding a, uh, a Bakelite or plastic type grip. This was actually a material called uh, Kunstloff, and it actually, it's a nice looking grip, really, but uh, that was added at the very end of the war because of material shortages. Wood was an issue for the buttstock, of course, as well as the grip panels, so uh, one other adjustment was made there. If you look on the early gun here, and on most of the guns, this, the, the stock actually gets a little bit wider where it goes into this receiver end cap. You can clearly see that right there. At the very end of the war, they stopped doing that. And this, these very light stocks are just cut from a completely flat piece. Uh, so this allowed them to get just a little bit more, more width uh, and a couple more stocks out of every chunk of wood. There was a little bit of a change uh, just in the magazine well. You can see this is, a, this is our MP44 and it's, it's pretty well covered up back there. Uh, by 1945, they, they were willing to accept a little less, so there was a filler piece that was left out. But that's really about the extent of the simplifications that were made to the gun. The closest thing to a real mechanical change uh, was simply the addition of one extra cut in the bolt carrier here. You, uh, this is our 1945, uh, the STG-44 bolt, and this is the MP-44 bolt. Uh, and you can see that this is solid. They added this cut. Uh, it made production more efficient. Uh, that's it. That's like the biggest mechanical change that was in there. The MP44 or MP43 or Sturmgewehr 44, it really is kind of a question of what's the best way to refer to this thing because they kept changing the names on them without actually making any substantive changes. At any rate, it really was, I believe, a pivotal change in small arms technology while the idea of short cartridge select fire rifles had certainly existed decades before, 
it was this, the German Sturmgewehr, that was the first time anyone really actually put that into practice in combat. And it had uh, huge fundamental effects on firearm, military firearms design for ever afterwards. Um, this led directly to the AK-47, uh, and then basically all military rifles that are in use today owe their, their existence uh, fundamentally and philosophically to this, these rifles right here. So uh, if you would like to have one of these, we have several cool options here on the table. Uh, all three of these are coming up for sale at Julia. So you got the, the 431 early transitional model, you've got this nice standard example of a 44, and then this really cool two-tone late, late pattern STG 44. Uh, if you take a look at the description text below, you will find uh, just links to Julia's catalog pages for all three of these guns. You can see their pictures and provenance and everything there. And if you decide you'd like to have uh, one, two, or all of them, if you're uh, really froggy about it, you can place bids uh, online or over the phone, or you can come here to the auction and participate live. Thanks for watching.